Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for being um, with us today for the Harvard Law School Library Book Talk. I'm Jocelyn Kennedy. I'm the executive director of the library, and I'm just thrilled that you're all here with us today. I want to thank the dean's office providing the lovely lunch that you're all eating, and I hope you'll enjoy it while Professor Steiner is sharing his book with us. Copies of today's book are on sale at the front of the room, so at the end of the talk, Professor Steiner will be signing his book, so that's a wonderful opportunity. And I just also want to let you know that today's rec um, talk is being recorded, and it, the recording will continue during the question and answer period, um, and should be available on the Law School's YouTube channel sometime next week, so that's exciting. So with those housekeeping details out of the way, it is my true great pleasure to introduce um, Emeritus Professor Henry Steiner, who's also the Jeremiah Smith Jr. Professor of Law. Um, Professor Steiner taught here at Harvard Law for over 40 years, or just about 40 years. And during his academic career, he really developed an expertise in, among other things, international law and human rights law. And as he notes in the foreword to his book, his work took him around the globe which provided him with a great opportunity to hone his other craft, in addition to his legal craft, which is his craft of photography, which he'll be sharing with us today. This collection of photographs um, curating um, Professor Steiner's book, Eyeing the World, really shows us not only, I think, the beauty of the, of the physical world, but as I looked at the faces of the people he photographed, I think it really captures um, a glimpse of his passion in human rights and human dignity. So without further ado, it's really my true great pleasure to introduce Professor Steiner. Thank you. turned on. Oh, you're welcome very much. Okay. You're good, perfect. I have to be reminded to turn point countless lights that I'm wearing at different places on and off as the thing goes on. So does everyone hear me very clearly? Perhaps too clearly? No? OK. Well, thank you so much. I think the library does an amazing service to the school. I've attended numbers of presentations in this series and really I uh, have enjoyed them, and I'm, I'm so pleased with this opportunity to speak with you, and uh, hope you all weren't heading toward another room where a person called Trump is outlining all the problems with Hillary Clinton, but maybe you've heard them already, so we'll stick with photography today. Um, I do want to, at the start, uh, recognize the presence of two people here. One is my wife, Pam, who's accompanied me on some of the journeys where I've taken photos. And uh, I hope I'm manipulating this thing right. There's a picture I took, a selfie of the two of us on one of our trips. So you'll recognize her the second the lights go on. There we are. <laughs> She's the one with the man's hat. Um, so, and uh, the other is Edua Wild, who's seated over there, who is my mentor with respect to software. I have all the capacity in the digital world, just what to do and how to do it, that your typical 86-year-old has in this world, which is a minus number. But she's been superb uh, architectural photographer herself in bringing me into this mysterious world and enabling me to master it when I started to film and work digitally through Photoshop and several other programs and get this book out and so on. So much appreciation, Edua, for everything you've done. So let me, uh, let me start. This is a, a wonderful opportunity. And uh, I thought a lot about what I might do with this um, really quite overwhelming crowd. I'm so pleased that so many of you were able to come out. I'm sure it was that light lunch that drew you in, but uh, the library's known for its excellent cuisine, but uh, still in all. Um, so what I want to do is divide this time, and I can assure you, oh, I forgot to mention one vital thing. It is uh, Deplorable. Oops, I can't word the word, use the word deplorable, I forgot. It is very sad that the commentator who appears 
on the um, posters that are about and in the emails that you have received cannot make it. Duncan Kennedy is a friend and one of the most intriguing people at this entire school. And uh, I asked him if he would like to comment. He said yes, but it turns out, and I learned just a few days ago, that he's convalescing, I think in good shape, from a health problem, an illness, and uh, was instructed not to leave his house this week, so he won't be here at all. Too bad for that, but as I look at you with your avid and bright and interested faces, I'm sure I have a room of about 70, 80 critics here who will provide all of the ammunition and cleverness and wit and depth that Duncan would have if he'd been able to be here today. So I, too, very much regret his absence, but there you are. So let me start. I'm going to divide this into two parts. And uh, the first part is going to be a kind of tour of the horizon. And the idea is to give you a sense of the range of my photography that goes back over a period of 50 years. As you will certainly gather from my voice and from what I have to say, photography is not a pastime. It is not a hobby. It is a deep passion, one of the things I enjoy most in my life. At the moment of first thinking that I have found a picture somewhere, a people of landscapes, of abstract objects, of whatever, something comes over me that can be described only as sheer joy and excitement and a kind of lust for what I might find and then mulling about it and thinking and walking here and there and how to take it and will the sun change in this period and checking all my environment and everything else. And those are precious moments. I'm going to show you pictures that are 50 years old back into the 60s and I can recall vividly to this day the first split second in which my eye saw something which I thought maybe. And that was the stage at which I started moving from simply uh, touristic or voyagers photography or snapshots of people or friends or the Parthenon or whatever and started to think of what I was doing as potentially art. And I should recall the one time that I was having some of my enlargements, and some of you may have seen them in the elevator lobbies in this very building on the basement and second and third floors. Um, when I first, when I was showing in a, in a show in Vermont where we spend a fair amount of time, um, I saw a picture. There was the picture, a name of it in a book. And then my name, Henry Steiner, and then it said profession. And underneath it said, oh my god, they made a mistake. They're calling me an artist. And then I thought, wow, well, I really am. My god, I did that picture, and they're showing the picture at this little ex exhibit for something or another. And I was kind of overwhelmed. Artist Henry, rather than Professor Henry. It sounded much more risque and challenging and daring and all in all, a life I'd never even hoped for. I thought it was totally beyond me. So I now think of myself in my more relaxed moments as an artist at rest. And uh, so that's just a little bit. What I'm going to do is take you on this tour of the horizon to give you a sense of the variety of things which I photograph. And uh, in doing that, I'm going, to, I'm going to pause at a few of them to say a few things, but mostly I'm just going to indicate where they were taken. And uh, my field was, as you learn, the field that I finally centered on, international human rights, a field which led to many, many voyages to many, many countries for one or another reason. And uh, I always managed to smuggle in uh, three hours at the end of this lecture I was giving or three days between this conference or this consultation or something and the next one further south in India so I'd stay in the north and photograph. So all the way through that plus my trips that were devoted entirely to photography plus my treks about four or five of them all together which were so well, my, all my photographic senses were there and uh, alert and functioning and, uh, and hiking and so on. So there you are. So I'm going to do that, and my categories are the most obvious. There are, as you well know, um, 10,000 ways of categorically looking at an object and uh, trying to fit it into what your categories will be. These are not at all abstract. They're not things which way underneath represent my religious beliefs or lack of religious beliefs or something. They're not those categories. They are simple, obvious categories, buildings, 
people, that kind of thing. But within each, I've gathered, you know, photographs which have their own variety in these categories. And when we're through with that, I'm going to go back, not go back to any with, with other photographs. I'm going to talk about quite personal experiences. Probably numbers of people here, maybe a great many of you, are well-versed and extremely talented photographers. And uh, we kind of form a, a community, a brotherhood, a sisterhood, or whatever. And uh, um, I, uh, so I, I know several of you might be interested technically, but I'm not going to make this a technical lecture about exactly what lens aperture I use for this or that, or what I struggled between this or that way of setting the camera. It will please some of you, it will mystify most of you, and it's not very relevant. In this day of automatic cameras, I'm an antique and go back to an earlier age where you actually did things yourself. Thank God I wasn't born under the age of self-driving cars. I want to continue driving my own car. And I love the fact that I have to set this camera and make all these decisions and know I'm making a trade-off here. And just what do I want out of this photo? So to this day, I've never used the automatic capacities, most of them, that come in today's modern cameras, such as your iPhones and all the rest. All preset. So, um, I, uh, so I, I will indicate some of the problems that this created when I get to that second part. And I'm not going to carry you into the technique, as I said, or to technical matter. But I'm going to give you my experiences when I think I first had a picture there. How did I react? Where was I? What made me think there was a picture? And what I'd love to hear from you, because I puzzled about it so much, is the assumption is that I've never studied photography. I've never read a book on how to take pictures um, uh, and, and so on. I'm self-taught, as most photographers are, as, as most people who draw are. There was no master's degree I got in how to take pictures and so on and so forth, though there are excellent photography schools for people who see photography more as a profession. They have a mission. They have a purpose. Ah, oh, absolutely, you're so useful for that. So I am going to tell you what out of this untutored past I'm going to speculate and I have a long time about what binds them together. I'm Henry Steiner. I was Henry Steiner at my birth and I'm Henry Steiner today and I can't imagine there are 2,000 different peoples occupying this body and this psyche and this brain, and each time I picked up a camera, a radically different person was manipulating it and choosing a picture and working with it on Photoshop or other softwares to, uh, to improve it, to bring it to where I was willing to make prints of it. So um, this, this is the, the situation, and um, I just wanted to say that uh, the assumption then has to be there's some continuity, but what is it? What binds all the diversity you're going to see together? Is it just a jumble? This guy shoots whatever he likes, whatever he thinks is pretty or ugly or savage or has real meaning or is very calm or is a nice abstract. Can you say any of those things when you've looked through this part one? And I'd like some speculation about that if any of you are interested when we have our discussion period to see what you see as binding in my book I have some text sections that are very short, but took a long, long time to write. The old war horse, I'm sorry to send you so long a letter, I didn't have time to write a short one. Well, that's the way I felt about those sections. And uh, some of you may be interested in reading some of that, and I'd love some speculation. Not only I'll ask about whatever you want and make whatever statements you want at that level. So let me start going fairly rapidly. Most of the pictures I'll just show for 10 seconds. We have a lot to go through in just a few minutes and then get on to the other part of it. OK, so the first group that I'm going to talk about I simply call crowds of people. There is nothing magic in that category. It's a banal one. It doesn't take you to any depth. It's just what they were about. So you can see even within that, that descriptive category, um, there's a considerable variety. So these simply blackout is not my best pictures, my black, blackout pictures, but it simply breaks between these things. So this was taken. I'll just indicate where these were taken. This were taken in central Bhutan at a small monastery that I wandered into and uh, walking down the entrance, which was open, and then it got closed in as you walked to, through this walls on both side entrance. This group turned a corner down below 
and we walked toward each other. And uh, I was just stunned by the, the amazing expressions on those faces. We got close to each other and had to pass by. And they all moved against the wall to, to my left as I was coming this way. And uh, I couldn't tell if they were assenting to a photograph, if they were politely getting out of the way, or what. But they formed themselves so beautifully, I could not believe it. Um, those robes and the colors and the relationships among the deep reds and the darker shades and the, the wonder and their expressions, just looking. So I just raised the camera and took it quickly before they moved at all, hoping I didn't insult them in any way, but sometimes a photographer has to take those worries. You never know. I don't know 99.9% .9 of the people I photograph and, uh, and, and think of as, as art photography. So there you are. So that's that picture. And uh, Did you say what year that was? I'm sorry. What year was that? That was taken. Uh, that was taken uh, in the 2000s. So in my book, I indicate what decade I took pictures in. I can't recall precise years. I never thought I'd publish a book. It's one of those things which just has been so exciting to me. This was taken about uh, 2007, I would guess, eight, after I'd started going digital. This is a digital. Not that you'll see, because what I did was take all those decades in which I'd done film photography, of course, initially black and white, then moving to color, and so on. And uh, I had them scanned into digital files so that as I worked on them, I could work digitally, though they never quite are as technically perfect and as, as much as you would want for the ones that were taken on digital cameras after about 2003. So this was taken in Rio. Uh, I stayed there for a year and a half at one stage, uh, 1965 to 7 period. And uh, the beach is the center of life at Rio during all of the warmer months. And I was wandering among all of this beauty, the shades of the, uh, the, shades of the umbrellas and the beauty of the women and all of this around. And um, I wanted to take a picture, but I was so closed in, I couldn't find a place to get perspective and give it some pattern. So I looked opposite me across the street, street, beach, water, and went up to the 10th floor of a hotel, went out on an open balcony that happily was there, leaned over almost as if I'm above them and saw my patterns, just went across the group, ringed in here by the, uh, by the umbrellas and letting the couple sunbathing in the middle act as the focus. That could never be taken again because they broadened the street now, cut into the beach, and if I were in that same balcony, it would look very much as if I were way to the side of it, almost seeing, and I love the fact that I got a view that almost made me in a hel placed me in a helicopter above it. So over here, this is uh, Varanasi, India, where many devout Hindus or their families have their bodies cremated. This is the Ganges River. I hired a rowboat to come around about quarter of 6 a.m., get out when I knew they would be going into the water early morning light and this as close to a painting as any that uh, I think I've, I've done. Um, and over here, this was in Bhutan. I went to see their annual, happened to be in Timphu, the capital, when they were doing their annual show of um, the monks dancing over here. And uh, here was this audience, everyone dressed in their finery. They all look so splendid, don't they? And the men there with their sashes and such standing by and the women in all of their beauty in, in these magnificent robes that were, and the children too are already in the robes as you can see. So that was that picture. Um, so we now go on to another section which are simply waterscapes. That's, I'm sorry, I'm blocking people here. Tell, tell me when I am. Um, so the waterscapes, this is in uh, Laos and it's a waterfall not far from Luang Prabang, the capital. And I was just fascinated by this tree and the roots. And it was quite a while, maybe 45 minutes, just on my belly over here somewhere, moving this way and that way. And uh, so this was my favorite picture. I took a few of these. Um, and then here we go to, this is the Mekong River that you all remember. Or maybe you don't. It's amazing. I assume everyone on Earth knows the Vietnam period and the horrors of those years. but. Most of you guys, you know, it's ancient history, the way I thought of the Civil War, maybe the way you think of Vietnam. It's a tough thing for teachers to learn, but as the students get younger and younger, their memories don't have historical reach 
back as far as yours did because you were born a few thousand years earlier, right? <laughs> so uh, this is one of those. I, I, again, I love my water. A great percentage of my pictures have water. What it does, it's saturation. It's uh, the reflections are so magnificent. How it plays with color, its ripples, its texture. There's so much to love in water here and mist. Those are two things I love to photograph. This is in Norway on a, in a national park, uh, somewhat north of Bergen, and uh, it was just so full of beauty. This is when my wife and I started what's become a constant in our marriage, doing long hikes together, and almost every summer since. We've been abroad or now off and up in Vermont on its wonderful hills hiking in this way. So this was our first great discovery of how we shared that, that great liking. And over here, another waterfall, um, a little pre I must say. And uh, all the, the colors, the slight colors on top there, I love these subtle variations in what mostly seems black and white except for the greens here and the different shades of yellow and brown and such that you get uh, over on top here. Um, and over here, this was a section in Patagonia in Argentina that blew my mind. I just could not believe it. This was a bay, Bahia Bustamante. And there was a promontory going out from that bay. We were staying at a little isolated place there uh, in that bay, right at the end of the Bahia. So we were walking out. Time and again, I have four pictures in the book of walking along that seashore for a period of three or four hours, it was an abundance. The French phrase, embarras de richesse, that's the way I really felt. It's too much, I can't bear it. Every corner I turn, I see another wonderful topography and organization of colors and spent lots of time wandering here and there and trying to see how I wanted to capture it. Um, so this is a new section and this is called um, this is just uh, people engaged in ordinary activities in nature. And uh, I must say, the Indian woman always blow my mind. Uh, these are working women. They're here working with a, a bull and uh, doing the farming and bending down, looking so elegant in their onerous work in these hot temperatures. Jewelry, <laughs> necklace, and bracelets, and earrings, and the stature that comes and the posture from carrying things on your head. I think if I were raised carrying things on my head, I'd be standing a little straighter and, uh, you know, have better posture altogether. But it, it does wonders for the body. So I just love the combination of the two. And uh, this, I met a waiter traveling by train through India. And um, he, uh, he, I said, where are you from? And he mentioned this village that sounded interesting. I said, well, if I rent a car and pay you so much, will you drive me out there? And you say there are almost no Westerners ever come there. So in his company, I had immunity. People did not turn their faces to avert me. They did not run away inside their houses. They just calmly looked at me with some astonishment as one of their own led me through. And these two gentlemen, worthy gentlemen, just kept looking at me seriously and questioningly with not a change in the behavior I'd spotted way back on the other side of this courtyard. Um, <clears throat> Over here, this is a picture I view as very mysterious. This was the outskirts of Kampala in Uganda. And I saw this lady in white. She might be an angel who just descended. You know, it was so unusual a costume that was obviously typical of the region. I saw a few others later. And uh, with the banana leaves and their shapes and all, I thought it had a great deal of mystery. And this is in Cambodia, its largest lake. And all of the village, as you can see, is on stilts behind. And everything goes by boat or swimming. And here's the mobile grocery store moving along um, through it. So this next section just does some landscapes, and I'll have to go rather quickly. This is in uh, the uh, Everest region of Nepal. This was a trek of about 10 days. And, uh, and this I love. It's the steppe, the northern steppe in Mongolia. And uh, just this whole herd of horses rushing across it out for their morning run and uh, without very stark field ahead of me and then the mountains rising so abruptly. Um, and this, I should say, this is a wonderful uh, way to exhibit something I love in my pictures as organizing features. And if I say to myself, oh my god, there's a picture of my kind, I can stop and now go through a list of things which perhaps drew that scene to my attention 
from my past experiences and knowing what I photograph, one of the most dominant are diagonals. I love strong diagonals in a picture. They pull it together in many, many ways. They give it, I think, tension and strength. And wow, this is a sea of diagonals. And I saw these, these animals coming around first, the yaks, immediately rushed back so that I could get the scene and climbed up from the path up here so that I could reach to the snow mountain and took that picture. And this again, clearly the importance of diagonals all the way through it, a scene in Umbria just below Tuscany. And this in Switzerland, Solio, very close to the Italian border, southern Switzerland, southeastern, and a storm brewing down there and heading in our direction. And this is the barn where we spent a lot of time, our time together in Vermont, uh, right by uh, where we live, uh, have a, where, where we stay there. So, and this looks to me like a scene out of Star Wars, you know, those valleys where people are streaking through, flying, or great machines are on their way. And uh, this is rice harvest with all its magnificent colors. So here we have more abstract. This is a pond at a place called Bellagio in Italy where I once spent about two or three weeks. And what was why I mentioned that is that so frequently when you're traveling, which I often do, I don't think my shots are touristic shots or it's not uh, like a record of where I spent my summer or what. But when you're traveling through, you have so much you've just got to hope for. And you may be out of luck. Maybe it's overcast and you need sun. Maybe the reverse is the case. Maybe it's the wrong season. Maybe there are tons of people crowded right around this and they're going to kill a picture. But here I was, and I went back to that little pond for, um, sorry, for seven times and took a different picture each time. Different wind, different ripples. The algae had a different formation on the top of the water. The fish here are out very decorously. Sometimes they're hiding under the algae. So this was the picture I liked most, and I had the luxury of taking it seven or eight times in different circumstances. Oh, sorry, wrong way. Um, so over here, this is a seabed in Patagonia, not the seashore here, but the mountains, with vegetation and other growth beneath a shallow stream, very clear weather, changing all the time with wind ripples and with the sun moving here and there and the clouds. And uh, I, I love this shot. Um, and this is also, it's like a painter's palette to me. It's in the, uh, the Gobi Desert in Mongolia on the outskirts of an oasis. And uh, so that's what that is. And uh, this is some family close relationships. I imagine this was in Laos, a small village, a grandmother and child. But we project constantly into photographs. We see things familiar with. So in my familial setting, this was clearly grandmother and grandchild. She might have been an upstairs neighbor. She might have been someone carrying a message from the mom. Who knows who she is? But I love the picture of the schoolgirl coming home. Is she lecturing her? I've told you 2,000 times not to whatever, to wear shoes, for example. Whatever she was saying, or you look so nice today, you've, uh, you've combed your hair. I don't know what she's saying, but you, we each project something different onto it. I think photographs are a little bit like Rorschach's in that sense. They invite us to associate all sorts of memories and experiences with what we're seeing. This was in La Paz, Bolivia, called Family Business. But I loved the, uh, the circle above between the two hats and how it carves around and goes down to include the, uh, the hats. And this over here, this was in Brazil back in the 60s. And it was um, a family scene. I don't know how I came upon it. I can't remember how I saw this one. But uh, sorry, touching things here. Um, I don't know how I got that close without them running around, reverting their faces or something. But somehow, I must have been even less imposing then than now and looked totally harmless. And they just kept up with the smile there. So wonderful, the granddad, I imagine, I don't know, affectionately down on the child, the husband and wife over there, the husband looking at me so calmly and fixedly. No smile there, just who is this fellow in the middle of sugarcane fields wandering by with a camera? And the wife, kind of shy and not looking directly at me. That was my imagination of it. But I, So over here, this I ran into at a beach north of Boston. And uh, it's a little story. Oh dear, I'm running a little late. I've got to hurry. I saw this bit of seaweed, which looked like calligraphy. And I liked it. But it was all sand. And it was in the, I couldn't take a picture that filled it in. So I picked up this stone. 
and dropped it right over there and thought that improved the picture. For months I suffered. I thought I had committed a violation of nature and simple human <laughs> decency. The task of a photographer is simply to record the world. That was my image at that very early stage. How I've been disabused of that view, disabused of that view in this world of post postmodernism and all the complexity of where is the text and what is the view, I now know how much the photographer creates the image afresh out of the material that's vital, of course, that the world provides. So I've lost all shame for having dropped that bit of stone. <laughs> and this was, wow, in a small village where I wandered through on my own, and this was just uh, west of Vietnam toward the Laos, toward, uh, uh, toward uh, the Hanoi, toward the Laotian border. And these kids started following me. Everyone else was out on the fields, and I felt like the Pied Piper. They rushed to this carved stone when we got to this opening. And this ringleader over here, I think he was mocking me. Who is this guy? I might be the first Westerner they ever saw. And he's got his butt sticking way out over there. And he said a few things to them. And they are roaring, particularly the boys. They're out of control with laughter. And I'm sure they were poking fun at me, but I've learned enough when I think I may have a picture just to keep the camera here and never put it down here. So there's the picture, ah, suddenly. But by the time I get it up here, it's disappeared. So I was just following them and watching, and this was the moment. Cartier-Bresson's notion of le moment décisif, the decisive moment, just wait for it and capture. And that was it here, almost all looking directly at him. He calmly looking at me, taking me in, a kind of defiance. I don't know quite what it was, so I had my projections going a mile a minute all the way through that. So here I saw all triangles, this triangle, that triangle, and I just stopped and was amazed. But when I saw the print, the triangle line here was not as clear as it is now. So I did what I often do to clone my intervention into the photograph, no fidelity to what I saw, and draw this line more clearly, eliminate, I felt like a genocidaire very badly. Some of the penguins and transplant a few over there so the lines become clearer and I could realize my first vision of just a series of triangles composing this picture. This boat, same thing. I took out a lot of the other debris to calm the front. I took out large stones, just made it a very plain foreground, and then this magnificent background over here. So uh, here, yes, uh, hold on one sec. No, I th think, let me see. Um, OK, now what I want to show here I'm running a bit late and I'm, we'll have to skip some things, but I'm sure they'll come up, some of them. So I wanted to compare these two pictures. I was going down a narrow Crete street and Pam was with me on that trip. It was after a human rights conference and we were toured for a few days. Um, and I looked up, suddenly to my right, there was a, an event going on at the next corner, a political rally. And I saw this woman, I thought, oh my God, that is magnificent. The blackness just veiled, polka dot dress and everything else, and she just stood out of the black. And that's where I had to rush, set my settings. Please don't move, please don't move as quick as I could and get her before she moved. So that was immediate reaction was the critical thing and how, how I took the picture. Over here, just the reverse. This was in Corfu, also Greece, but in a very different section, another island. And I got, went onto this street walking alone through the village. I do almost all my photography alone and feel so much better with it. I don't want interruption. The person I'm with gets incredibly bored when I just stand looking at something for three minutes in a row and want to spend a half hour there. So it's not a good idea to be with anyone. I was behind her, but then realized this is a dramatic surrounding, so beautiful. So I rushed ahead of her around this corner. So she was out of sight, found this little bit of sunlight framed by the shadows before and after, was able to make my settings and waited for her to turn the corner and got her. So that was direct opposite, really planning my picture in advance and not being at all surprised by what I saw. Same thing here. I saw this wonderful area where all these patterns came together from a harvest. And she was way back there. And I just said, my god, maybe she'll walk in this direction. And kept saying, don't budge, don't budge, don't look at me, don't be nervous. I'm innocent, I'm harmless. And uh, she just got right in the middle of it, and I could take my picture again, just waiting for it. But you're in the hands of other people, like the woman, whether she's going to divert, quit doing the harvesting, or whatever. So over here, this amazing boulder. 
I saw this boulder on the outskirts of a Hindu temple in Tamil Nadu in southern India. God knows how they got there. They must have been washed up by the oceans. Oh, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands or millions of years ago. They're, they're just enormous boulders. And no, he was not there. So I see it and I say, well, it's a very stark photo. They were all around this perimeter and I was doing the perimeter. And thought, well, this is a good one. I'll take it. But it's so stark, it's going to be relentless. Suddenly, I couldn't see it because of the shadow. He stands up and it's just stunning. He immediately put the boulder under perspective, how enormous it was. The picture suddenly became menacing. It may fall on him, you know, it had that thing. The whole picture became surrealistic. Man in a harsh nature, whatever else went through my mind. But I clipped it. And again, I, had, I was already with my camera. But if he turned a speck, it would have killed this notion of just the silhouette against the boulder, which is just what I wanted. So there's a lot of luck involved. And that was the last second change that gave me the picture that I think made this a much better picture. This too, the one over there was the driver of the car I rented in Cambodia. This was my guide. We were going up a uh, religious mount, holy mountain, and there were shrines that were like tents. Uh, and uh, they were open, so like you could see right in from the path. It wasn't closed and private. And they too knelt before this nun who had invited them in. And I just loved it. It was darker inside, but I saw these three faces, and I loved the driver's face, and also my guys, which is a little bit craftier, a little bit less fully devout and believing and open to the imagination of the divine. And, uh, and then when I saw the print, as I say often, no one's more surprised than the photographer, you've got all these other statues around that add to the religiosity of the scene that I couldn't see in the back. And this worshiper over here, and the hands of the person behind him, that all add to the mysticism, I think, and uh, devoutness of the scene. So often you have to take the picture quickly. You can't see it well. And wow, you may want to erase it and clone it and delete it. You may want to leave it in and here. Wow, it was a better picture than the one I thought I was taking. Over here, the question is how to make yourself invisible. And it's a tough problem. I do not shade easily into this company. I am not invisible, which is my ideal status when I want to capture interactions between people. So I learned about this meeting in the village. Everyone was staring at me, which means no pictures of people at least. And uh, then the, the, I learned from someone, my guide, I think. I had a Sherpa guide with me in the middle of nowhere in, in the mountains. And, uh, uh, so he said, there's going to be a political rally. We can wait for part of it, but then we have to get on before nightfall to reach uh, where we'll be sleeping tonight, uh, camping tonight. And um, so I, he, I, well, I went to this spot. He showed me where it would be. I saw the mic already up. I camped myself here, and everyone was staring at me. And I just sat immobile. And uh, when they and the crowd came in, maybe about 30 people altogether. This has about 15 of them. And they lost sight of me, and then full attention to the speaker, so I could sit here in bliss, completely invisible, not in anyone's consciousness, and just see how they interacted, and wait for what I wanted. I think it's just a, uh, a symbol of political galleries. The dog is asleep, very sensible. The girl is yawning. This woman with her child, raptly attentive, as is the man before her, as is the man behind her. A girl rushing into dad's arms. It was the whole human drama of how people, and this was the Communist Party with all the red here, arguing in one of Nepal's very few open nonviolent elections in the mid, mid 90s. So over here, this was stunning. This was a rally of a party that had advocated human rights in Siem Reap, Cambodia, Cambodia, the Khmer Rouge, one of the cruelest of genocides. You all know about that, the brilliant movie, The Killing Fields, and uh, just, just horror, horror over those years. And here, after the overthrow of the Khmer Rouge, about 15 years later, this party, one of its planks is human rights. It's a minority party, and a more conservative party was in power. But uh, it was an open society. They're cheering for a human rights party. And the way I got here was the opposite of being very careful and planning. I put myself totally into the hands of a young person who was about 14, who had his little motorbike in my carriage that I was in behind it. And uh, so he spoke no English. I spoke no Khmer. He simply beckoned me when he parked his little jalopy. And he led me through this whole crowd. I was way at the back. 
who didn't do it, never explained what I wanted to do, lifted ropes surrounding sections so I could get under, pushed them down so I could step over them, took me all the way up to a raised platform where the speaker was speaking and lots of priests were gathered, and uh, pointed to a ladder and said, want to go up? So I did. And I moved slowly to the front, and I suddenly was in the front row of this platform with thousands of people ahead of me with my camera. And it seemed like an unbelievable situation that I had dreamed of, and suddenly it was like real. So I took my time, and the, the, he spoke very much in the political oratory uh, genre of the day, and uh, he'd get uh, more and more puffed up, and the voice rose and rose, and you know it was going to reach a climax, and the crowd was getting more restless. And finally, it broke, like with, we shall overcome, or some equivalent phrase, right? And they went wild. So I just waited for one of these crescendos, you know, to come back and had exactly the moment I wanted. So I think that's as much as I want to say. In fact, we are going to start. So questions, comments, whatever you like, let's go. <laughs> or, or would, would, To what do you owe your passion? Is it from encouragement from your family? Is, it, is there historical artists in your background? Do you, were you paying attention to you a lot when you were a child? Where does this passion come from, do you think? I have no idea. I think uh, in my own personal family, for example, there are a lot of people who are committed to public interest work. My brother was. He was long here at Harvard. And uh, I have lots of cousins who were. And uh, one of my sisters, women did much less in that age, strong public interest commitments. My parents were, you know, hardworking and uh, there, and I couldn't say it was a dominant part of family life. Where did it come from at that generation in my family? I don't know. Osmotically from somewhere, or just as we individually grew up, we had similar temptations and orientations in trying to choose what kind of work we wanted to do. It's the same with photography. I took to it the way I took to music. The two are very similar. I started to love classical music in my teens. I'd save my allowance for weeks. It was the world of 78 RPMs that weighed a ton. And I'd buy an opera, probably Puccini those days, you know, started with the romantics. And I'd cart it home like this, you know, they really weighed. And to go through a three hour opera, you needed lots of 78 RPM discs. So I can't tell where any of those things came from except my interaction with my school, teaching me different things, reading more and more, looking at photography books, others. But it, sweat, it just developed within me and became the way other things dropped off and didn't. And I don't have a good answer to your question. The migration from film to digital photography changes the workflow process. In your case, do you think it changed um, your sense of composition and opportunity and what you saw um, you in a photo? digital? Yeah. I think it changed it a great deal. I think whatever talent I have, and I won't express an opinion, you'll have your own, for things like composition, colors, working with them, saturating, desaturating, relationships between colors, too much magenta, not enough magenta, things my teacher was very strict on my observing, you know, and working with softwares. I think I've learned a lot of skills and see colors and their relationships to each other much more carefully now. But um, I think what digital has done mostly, before I had the image that 99% of it is in the taking of the picture, and then I gave it to a black and white photographer, when I got to color, I didn't have the time to have a chemically managed exact temperature darker, and there was just no time for that. So I'd indicate to the uh, one who developed the film and made the prints what I want. Well, can you do this here and there? But it was very vague. What uh, digital does is open up for you another world of possibilities. The magic moment is my thinking I've got a picture and searching for it, and then taking it and being pleased when I see the print, right? And then, but then that's only halfway through in time. It's the dramatic moment where everything's concentrated, but I love working on Photoshop. I can spend Sunday, oh my god, I've been on this part of the picture for two hours without even recognizing it. But I have time constraints there too. 
So um, it's made the whole process of working post taking the picture much more creative. I don't put your hat on this person's shoulders. I don't do trick photography of any sort, which is fun, but it's not my thing. But I work to improve what I've got, and that may invite uh, cloning things away or moving something here and there to make the picture starker. I'm really trying to create some kind of a work of art, a good photograph, so that I will be most attracted to it, and I hope people will be also. And that's now within my power. So I put a lot of time in working on these files, I used to be called negatives, and trying to make better of them before I print them. I'm, I'm sorry? My hearing is not the best. I apologize for that. But Yes. So I wonder, how, how, how do you like uh, these new media formats? Are uh, still photos better in some ways? Yeah. I tell you, I'm of my generation. And uh, that means that I, I have not gotten into social media. I have to ask my son to distinguish between Twitter and um, any other form of social communication. Exactly what is the nature of a tweet? Things that all of you simply know, the way you know heaven and earth, and so on and so forth. And it's very tough for me to grasp. It was very tough to learn Photoshop, all of that. And I don't do, do things that will instantly put my photos on the web. I have them only on my website and in a book as the, as, as the collections. So I'm not into that world. I would never allow any of my photos, which I feel patrimonial towards. I feel I've invested energy and emotion and um, I'm pleased with them. They give me pleasure when I look at them. That uh, I've invested that, and I would never give away the rights to anyone to put them on the back of calendars, to put them here, put them there, on coffee cups, whatever it might be. That's not what I do them for. And the book I did fundamentally, not to be a bestseller, though perhaps the people here will make it that. Who can tell? <laughs> um, but because I wanted to leave a legacy that about something that meant a great deal to me, I very much doubt that any of my grandchildren will ever read that brilliant article on X and Y that I wrote in 1997, but they may well look at a photography book. So the notion was really to achieve something of that, a little permanence in the world, a little something I could leave for great nephews and nieces, grandchildren, let alone my wife and child and other close friends, who have seen, those who have liked it and gotten some pleasure from it. So I, I, I have no interest in it being widely sold, though if it were to sell, I would not go into mourning. Um, so I was just wondering that, did you uh, sort of consciously at times make an effort that, you know, when you look at these images, you're not analyzing them as a human rights practitioner, as an expert, because I guess automatically you would think, here's the context, here's the history, here's the position this person may have in society. Did you feel like an escape, that let's look at the world just as it is, without the background, without the story? Or were the two sort of inextricably linked to each other? How you look at the world and how you photograph? I do believe, as I said, I don't believe on 10,000 people over the course of my life who suddenly inhabit this frame and this psyche. And I'm totally different when I take every picture. Of course, none of us believes that at that extreme. But I think there's something very deep in my picture taking which is another way of my looking into the introspective and revealing mirror and seeing different parts of me. I think, and I spell this out a little more in the book in these brief sections where I speculate among other things and what's the link between my two principal commitments, of course, my teaching and my scholarship at the law school and toward the end and in human rights as a very fundamental theme and the photography. They're so different but they are the two most important and they've given me the greatest pleasure. So the photography is a little bit like writing a paragraph and writing is tough for everyone. And if I write a paragraph time and again and time and again and I know what I want to say and it's suddenly right, I feel the kind of ecstasy I felt when I see 
the picture. Yes, I put it together in this way, and it's, it's what I feel. It's what I want to do in that picture. Maybe landscape composition, maybe interaction between two people or a group, whatever it might be, maybe an abstraction. So that's, that's what I'm trying to, uh, to do. And um, I think the link that I've talked about that may or may not convince anyone, I'm not out to convince anyone, I'm really still raising the question with me, is that I think you can't really be committed to a field like human rights or its domestic equivalents, refugees, any of the thousands of related fields that's so full of the world's ugliness and brutality and terror and inhumanity, the dark, dark side of who we are, the darkest, and not be something of an optimist, to assume that there's something transcendent in our lives that we are working towards. I don't think I'm a consciously religious person, but I think I have a sense of something clearly transcending our formal physical existence. I don't know if there's an afterlife. I, it's not, not at that level of complexity and, uh, and belief, but uh, it is some sense that there are transcendent ideals, transcendent notions, and nature is one of those great sources of enormous beauty and the divine, whatever I mean by the divine and other people are too. I see in a lot of my subjects a tremendous decency and earnestness. I admire that woman struggling up the hill with her cane. I admire her seeing her from behind. I like the resolution. I like the tenacity. I like her confronting age, which all of us, if we live long enough, must confront, and still struggling ahead with dignity. And dignity is a fundamental postulate of the entire human rights system. Equal human dignity is perhaps its most fundamental postulate, and I'd say it's a necessary postulate to human existence if I want to go further and try to find some transcendent notions that seem to me must invade life if we're to continue to live it in any kind of human and humane situation. So I see that, but I don't. You can say, well, you're a human rights guy. Look at these photos. I didn't see a single Auschwitz. I didn't see anything from the Cambodian genocide. You showed a picture of a lot of people cheering for human rights years after it ended. I didn't see emaciated children with swollen bellies, starvation and homelessness, and the thousands of things we see every day in the newspaper of man's cruelty to man in one or another way, or impervious to the sufferings of others when we can help, right? That's one of the themes, of course, in this presidential debate. It's been a theme for so long. What are our duties as a nation and people to think of others who are being obliterated and savaged, even as we speak, etc.? What, if any, are our duties? That's certainly a basic theme, uh, almost at the forefront of this, this ongoing debate. So I think here, I'm looking a little bit idealistically at what my ideal is if human rights are more observed, that these people are allowed to have their dignity. They're mostly poor. I don't, crea I don't photograph. Um, Hollywood starlets and top models and all of the contrived gorgeousness of the world. There's no one here who remotely approaches any degree of fashion. That's not what I'm doing. They turn out to be poorer. Is that because they're closer to nature or closer to God? I don't know however one phrases it. I don't know, but they, they're, they're people who attract me and I admire them and I think it's related to one of the ideal themes of the work I've been engaged in more than it is to the actual malpractices that seem to dominate the world at times. Thank you. Thank you, Henry, for this wonderful project. Um, this, I, I don't really know how to phrase this question, but I see, in, uh, I see the pictures around the halls, and I see uh, time stopped, uh, but it didn't stop for them. It hasn't stopped for any of us, the photographer or any of us. Yes, you arrested. You freeze a you moment. You freeze a moment. Uh, there's a certain pathos about that in my mind, which is hard to express. Uh, but I'm just wondering if you, if you felt any sense beyond capturing the moment of duty towards this world that you've portrayed in your photography. Uh, in that time framework or subsequently? Did you feel a pathos that, that uh, made you want to reconnect with any of these settings or people mm -hmm. or find out more about them or go back to them? You say they, you, you surprise some of them, they, 
tolerated you or they mm -hmm. they were there and they Worst, weren't aware. Best of all is being invisible and just watching them closely. Exactly, exactly. But you've made it all visible. So is there some... I, I see photography more as a, as a document mm -hmm. and a gateway to history. Uh, but uh, I'll, uh, what is you your feeling about that? You can see it so many ways. I am missionless. There's no particular constituency I can name that would buy this book. Someone said, I know someone who just did a book on women farmers in New Hampshire. Well, that's not the world's most exciting theme, but if you're a woman farmer in New Hampshire, it's damn exciting and you're going to line up the night before this book becomes available and buy it. I have no such constituency. It's not a particular area, not a very firm, explicit ideology. I'm not a, a crime a photojournalist. I'm not a UN photojournalist. I don't have those missions. I'm simply, I think, as best I can explain what I think some of the sources of my pictures are. But I would say I'm overwhelmed by what I see. You see the mystery, the mood, the majesty of nature. It has meaning. It's something more than an accident of hundreds of thousands of years of rivers flowing and valleys being carved and grass seeds around to sprout in particular seasons. There's something that's transcendent in it, a kind of beauty, perhaps that sustains us, you know? And that's, I've become more appreciative of that as the years have gone on. And I find in these simple human interactions, my people show, my pictures show people praying, okay? Engaged in politics, parenting, um, working in commerce, um, meditating very solo, uproarious fun in a group, all different ways in which people nourish each other and do things that I think of as so much a part of life. So I'd have to speak at that general level. Uh, you can draw analogies. There was this great show called Family of Man at the Modern Museum, MoMA, years ago, and it made a tremendous hit. Margaret Mead was the uh, guiding light among anthropologists, and some very famous photographers were in it. There's something akin to that that I'm doing. It's not the same. It's very different. But I feel some affinity to that kind of undertaking. Time for one more question. Thank you very much, Professor Steiner.